Hey church, I'm really excited for today because we are starting a brand new six-week series through the book of Galatians. Probably the most, not just probably, certainly the most influential Christian author of all time. It's not Rick Warren. It's not Tim LaHaye. It's actually the Apostle Paul. The Apostle Paul wrote 13 of the 27 books of the New Testament. So the Bible is split into Old Testament, New Testament. The Apostle Paul, in the New Testament, 27 of those books, the Apostle Paul wrote over 48% of the New Testament. 13 out of 27. So yeah, he's pretty influential. And the first book that he wrote, the first letter, if you're putting them in chronological order, is a letter to the Galatians. And I love the six-chapter letter of Galatians. It's one of my, I love the whole Bible, but I just, I love reading Galatians. It fires me up every time I read it. And so for the next six weeks, we're going to do a little Bible study together here at church. In fact, I encourage you at home with your family, with your small group, or with your mentor, go online to pursuegod.org forward slash Galatians and follow along with us. Do the full series together with your small group. There's discussion questions, all that stuff. To get the most out of this series, you're going to want to do more than just listen to a sermon. You're going to want to talk about it with your family group or mentor. So I hope you'll do that. I'm excited about going through this series with some of the people that I'm mentoring in my life. I'm excited about going through it with my own kids. There's just so much in here. Now, here's where we're going in this six-week series. Today, we're going to talk about the one gospel. We're going to learn that that Paul is sharing the one gospel, but there's a group that comes in to the churches in Galatia that are trying to confuse them and offer a false gospel. We're going to talk about that in just a minute. In week two, we're going to talk about these two meetings. Week two is chapter two, right? So there are these two meetings, the meeting, the, the very first council of the church in, uh, in Jerusalem. We read about that in Acts 15, and we also hear about it in Galatians chapter two. So that's the first meeting we'll talk about next week, very historical. And the second meeting we'll talk about is a little more personal. It's a meeting between Peter and Paul, where Paul has to call Peter out on his hypocrisy. That's going to be fun next week. In week three, we're going to talk about the promise. So we're going to go back all the way back to Galatians 12. We're going to talk a little bit about the promise that God gives to Abraham that Paul then talks about in chapter three of this letter. It's a little bit of a history lesson, but it's Really, it's really good. It's really important. Week four, we're going to talk about labor pains. Paul says, I feel like a woman in labor pains when I think about my love for my children, the Galatians. And so that was the first application of that word. But actually later in the chapter, he talks about these two famous women from the Genesis story, a couple of, uh, couple of moms So there's that whole labor pain thing. So week four will be fun also. And then in week five and week six, we're going to end our series the way Paul ends the letter because he talks about true freedom. This whole thing, this whole whole letter, the whole Bible is all about God's heart for his people that they would have true freedom. And so we're going to finish up by talking about that just like Paul does in his letter. And we're going to be talking about that kind of all throughout this this whole series. So that's our five-week series on Galatians. I'm excited. I hope you're excited about it. One more thing before we jump in. I'm just going to challenge you. Every day for the next six weeks, I wonder if you'll be able to do this, I want you to read a chapter from Galatians. That means that in six weeks, you will have read Galatians six times. So I want to challenge you. I hope some of you will take me up on that challenge and that you'll read it. And if you want to add a couple of other chapters in there to round out these next six weeks, write this down. You can read Acts chapters 13, 14, and 15, because that's some of the, some of the backstory to the letter of Galatians. And we're going to get into some of that today. So we're excited about it. I hope you are too. Let's jump into the letter, Paul's letter to the Galatians. Here's the first thing we're going to learn. On Paul's first missionary journey, he traveled through the region of Galatia. It's modern day Turkey. So if you look at a map today, you're not going to find Galatia anywhere. Today, it's kind of in the, in the region of Turkey. And Paul traveled through there to share the gospel and to plant churches. Now we're going to spend a little bit of time in Acts before we get into Galatians, because I want to make sure that you get some of the backstory. Again, you can read 
The full context for yourself, Acts chapter 13 and chapter 14, tell the story of Paul's very first missionary journey. And here's what it says. Paul and Barnabas traveled inland to Antioch of Pisidia. The reason I underline that is because that is in the region of Galatia. Some of you might have a, a nice Bible like this, and you might, if, if you have a study Bible, you probably have some maps at the back of your Bible, and you'll, you can see exactly what we're talking about. You can trace Paul's first missionary journey if you're interested in that. It says, on the Sabbath, they went to the synagogue for the services. So again, the synagogue is where the Jewish the Jewish people were worshiping the God of the Old Testament, but you have to remember at this point, Christianity was still just a, let's think of it like as a Bible study within the Jewish church, right? And so Paul goes to the synagogue because Paul was Jewish. Most of the Christians at this point were Jewish. And so Paul goes to the, to the synagogue on the Sabbath for the services, and he starts sharing the message of Jesus with the Jews in the synagogue. Now, later on in verse 43, it says that many Jews and devout converts to Judaism followed Paul and Barnabas, and the two men urged them to continue to rely on the grace of God. And I've underlined that section about Jews and devout converts, because I want to make sure you understand something because this is gonna come up today, it's gonna to come up in the next few weeks as well. In the, in, the early, in, the, in the Jewish synagogue, there were two types of people. There were people who were born Jews, and then there were a very small handful of people who were converts to Judaism. In other words, they weren't Jewish by birth, but they converted and became Jewish and worshiped the God of the Old Testament. Now, in order for them to do that, they had to follow all these Jewish rituals. They had to get circumcised. They had to follow the kosher laws. All this stuff that they wouldn't have grown up with, they had to jump through those hoops if they wanted to convert to Judaism. And this, some of these people were now responding to Paul's message. And Paul's message was real simple. It was a message about Jesus. He basically was saying, Jesus is the Messiah that we've been waiting for, that we've been reading about in our scriptures, the Old Testament, and Jesus is finally here. And so Paul was telling people about Jesus. Many people followed Paul and Barnabas. They were convinced. And I love what this last thing I underlined, I love what Paul says. It says that they urged them to continue to rely on the grace of God. Underline that in your Bibles, highlight that in your Bibles, because that's what Galatians is all about. We're going to see that as we continue to read. Now, here's what happened. A group of false believers infiltrated the Galatian churches and brought a different message. So again, you can read about it for yourself. Paul and Barnabas are doing work in the region of Galatia, <coughs> chapter 13 of Acts, chapter 14 of Acts. Eventually, they leave the area. As soon as they leave the area, there's this group of people that came in. Now, it might seem a little judgmental that we're calling them false believers, but trust me, those are Paul's words, not mine. These were Jewish Christians who believed something a little bit different than what Paul believed. They were Jewish, but they called themselves Christians. They said they loved Jesus. They said they believed in Jesus. They wore the Jesus t-shirts and they had the Jesus jammies all the Jesus trappings, except they had a message that for some of you watching this today, you might think that their message just seems like maybe just one degree off. But trust me, it wasn't just one degree off. These guys were called the Judaizers. And here was their message. I put it into an equation because I'm a math guy. Salvation equals Jesus plus works. This is what the Judaizers taught. Now, Paul comes in, and Paul teaches the first thing that Paul taught. Paul taught this other equation. Paul taught that salvation equals Jesus plus nothing. I hope you bought that t-shirt. That's what the t-shirt's all about. Jesus plus nothing. Paul's message when he was preaching in the synagogues in his first missionary journey in Acts 13 and 14, Paul's message to those Jews and to the devout converts into Judaism, and then later 
his message to the Gentiles, people who weren't even in the synagogues at all. His message was really simple. Jesus did all the work. You can't do any of the work. Jesus did it all when he went to the cross. He died on the cross and he rose from the dead. This was Paul's message. The Judaizers said, Paul's wrong. They swept into the Galatian churches and they said, Paul's wrong. What Paul said isn't right. Paul didn't go far enough. Paul almost has the truth, but he doesn't have all of the truth because the Judaizers didn't just want people to become Christians. The Judaizers, hence their name, wanted people to become Jews and then Christians. The Judaizers said, hey, converts, if you want to become a Christian, you have to become a Jew first. You have to jump through all those Jewish hoops, the, the obeying the set, you know, observing the Sabbath and getting circumcised and, and all of this Jewish holy days and eating kosher, all these things. You have to be, you have to be Torah observant. The Torah is the, is the Old Testament rules and regulations, the laws of Moses. They would say that you have to be Torah observant. You have to observe the Torah if you really want to be accepted by God. So they were this, the, really the, the church's very first sort of hybrid Christian. They were Jesus plus. Today we have all kinds of churches out there, all kinds of religions, all kinds of preachers out there. And I want to encourage you as we read this to pay attention because maybe you also could be like the Galatians where you could fall for that kind of a message. And I just want to warn you, it is not just a little bit off. It is way off. And that's why Paul wrote the letter to the Galatians. Paul wrote Galatians in response to the false gospel of the Judaizers. Finally now, we're ready to look at Galatians chapter one. I love this part where it says this in verse six. Paul says, I am shocked. Notice the language he uses. He says, I am shocked that you are turning away so soon from God who called you to himself through the loving mercy of Christ. I am shocked. Turning away so soon? Paul had just shared the gospel with them. They had just converted. He said, rely on the grace of God. And already, as soon as he leaves and the Judaizers come in, they said, oh yeah, okay, we'll believe that message now. Paul says, I'm shocked that so soon you're turning away. What are you thinking? He says, you are following a different way that pretends to be the good news. Now, some of your translations, depending on what translation you have, this is the New Living Translation, but some of you might have the word gospel in there because the good news, another word for that is gospel. You've probably heard that before. The gospel is the good news. He says, you're following a different way that pretends to be the gospel. It pretends to be the good news, but look at what he says. But it is not the good news at all. You are being fooled by those who deliberately twist the truth concerning Christ. He's talking, of course, about the Judaizers. Now, why is that not good news? Why is, it got, why is Jesus plus works not good news? The truth is many of us want to believe that's true because there's this, this, there's this urge in, in every human being. It's in me, it's in you, it's in your neighbors, it's in everyone. There's this, there's this innate desire to want to try to earn what we get. It's actually a very American thing. We want to earn what we get. So we say, Jesus, thank you for what you did for me on the cross, but let me add my goodness to that. You did most of it. You did 80% of it, but let me help out. Let me do... 20%. Let me try to pay you back a little bit. Let me try to pull myself up by my bootstraps and, and let me try to earn my standing with you, God. Because after all, that's, that's what we do in school. We have to earn our grades and that's what we do in work. We, we earn it. That's what we do in sports. We have to earn it. In every other area of life, we have to earn it. So it seems to make sense that in faith, we should have to earn it. The problem is, the reason, is, the reason that it's not good news is that nobody has ever earned it that way. The Bible says in the Old Testament, Isaiah the prophet, he says, your 
righteous deeds are like, now wait for this. He says your righteous deeds, your good things that you bring to God, that you put on the table, you say, here, let me earn it. Let me, let me try to work for it. Isaiah said your righteous deeds are like filthy rags. You can't earn it. You are utterly broken. You are utterly powerless. You can't earn it. If you don't believe it, just start reading the Old Testament over and over and over and over again. It's just a testament to the fact that they couldn't earn it. Paul talks about this later on in Galatians. So we'll get to this in chapters three and four. So it's not good news what the Judaizers were bringing. It was a burden. It was bondage. And so that's why Paul is using such strong language here when he says these things. In verse 8, I love what he says in Galatians 1.8. He says this, Let God's curse fall on anyone, including us, or even an angel from heaven, who preaches a different kind of good news than the one we preached to you in Acts 13 and in Acts 14 on Paul's first missionary journey. When he came into those synagogues and preached the message, when he went out into the streets and preached to the Gentiles and said, here's good news, everybody. Jesus did all the work. When you trust in Jesus, you can be made right with God. Jesus did it all for you when he went to the cross and when he died on the cross and when he rose from the dead to prove his dominion over hell and Satan and the grave and your sin. Jesus did all of it. That's good news. You don't have to add anything to it. That's good news because you can't. And I love what Paul says there. He says, even if an angel from heaven preaches a different kind of good news, don't believe it. See, look, if I was, was going to start a false religion tomorrow, I wouldn't come to you and say, hey, guess what I just thought of? No, no. I would come to you and I would say, I had a vision from God's messenger. That's called an angel. An angel came to me and an angel told me, no, 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 you, you're almost right. But actually, this is what's really true. And throughout history, many religions, many false religions have been started because of an angelic revelation. And that's why I think it's so pertinent what Paul is saying in verse eight. He says, let God's curse fall on anyone. Those are fighting words. Including us, he says, even us. Even if I in my second missionary journey, change the message. Don't believe it because God doesn't change the message. He doesn't change his mind. He says, whether it's us or whether it's an angel from heaven, if anyone preaches a different kind of message, don't buy it, don't listen to it because it's not good news. And so what is the one message that Paul preached? Well, I actually like how Romans says it. Paul, one of the 13 books that Paul wrote is Romans. In Romans chapter 3, verse 22, it says this. This is the gospel according to Paul and according to Jesus and according to the New Testament and according to the Old Testament. We are made right with God by placing our trust in Jesus Christ. And this is true for anyone who believes, no matter who we are. This is the good news. Now, Paul, the letter to the Romans was a little bit later in Paul's life. But what I love about it is you're going to see this message all over the place in Galatians in the next six weeks. But I love that by the time he writes the letter to the Romans years later, he real I mean, it's all the same stuff. He doesn't change his mind. But man, does he say it in such a powerful, simple way. I love it. We're made right with God by blank. By what? By working for it? By going to church? By tithing? By giving? By being a good person? By trying really hard? By having good intentions? By staying married? Those are all good things, but those things don't save you. We are made right with God by placing our trust in Jesus Christ. The way we say it in our 12-week discipleship course called The Pursuit, the way we say it there is we start a relationship with God by trusting Jesus. And this is where we get it from. That's how we start. That's the only way to start. If you're watching this today and you want a relationship with God, in fact, maybe you're watching this today and you're starting to wonder if you even really had a relationship with God because some of this stuff that you're hearing in Galatians sounds like what you've believed. Maybe you've believed more of a Judaizer's message than Paul's message. And I don't want you to feel guilty about that. It's the messenger that confused you. But today you can make that right by placing your faith in Jesus Christ. 
If you are trying to work your way to heaven, that is self-centered. That is full of pride and ego. What it takes to come to Jesus, to really come to Jesus, is humility. To say, I can't do it and you can. It is an abomination to God, the thought that you can add to what Jesus did on the cross because it diminishes the work of Jesus on the cross. You can do nothing. Jesus did all of it. Thank Jesus. Thank you, Jesus, for doing all the work so that we don't have to do any of it because we can't do any of it. And I want to show you this picture. And it's a picture we're going to come back to kind of time and again through this series because it's, I, I think it's kind of the central theme of the book of Galatians. And I call it the sweet spot of grace. It's like grace is right in the center of the picture. It's in the center of the picture of Galatians. It's in the center of picture of Paul's life, of my life, of the New Testament, of the Old Testament. It's all about grace. Grace is gift. God gives this gift that you can't earn, even though you want to try to earn it. You can't earn it. Quit trying. It's grace. And the beauty of it, and we're going to see this over these next six weeks, the beauty of it is, is when you're standing in grace, that's where you have freedom. If you come over here to the right side where you have works, this is the, these are the Judaizers. They're trying to earn their way, and, and there's no freedom there. There's bondage when you veer away from grace into works. But you can also veer to the other side of the equation, and you can veer into sin. And this is, Paul addresses this later on. The, the message of the gospel is not that we're saved by grace, therefore do whatever you want. Just live however you want to live, live this sinful life. No, not at all. No, the message of grace is, is we're saved by grace and therefore we can live in freedom to, to be obedient to God, to, to live from the inside out, to honor God with our lives. And we're going to see that in Galatians chapters 5 and 6. And so Paul's saying, stay right here where grace is in the middle don't veer off to works to try to save yourself and don't veer off to sin so that you're just living and, and stepping all over the grace of God. No, no, the sweet spot, the central theme of Galatians is that grace is right in the middle of it all. It's in the middle of the picture. So I want to finish with this question. I've already probably asked it a few times, but I want to be clear about it today. Are you trusting in Jesus alone for salvation? Or have you fallen for a different gospel. I said it earlier, but it is so true. There are so many ideologies. There are so many narratives out there. There are so many religious theologies that would preach something that, that just tweaks the message just one degree, two degrees. But one degree at the beginning is a mile away at the end. And if, if, you, if you are trusting in something else to save you, your works, your effort, maybe some other person, some religious leader you think is gonna save you, maybe some, you think some church could save you or membership in some church could save you, you fill in the blank for yourself. The question is, have you fallen for a different gospel like the Galatians so quickly did right after Paul left? And, and if you have, I, I just pray that God would reveal that to you so that you would course correct. So that you would say, oh man, what was I thinking? There's no reason for guilt or shame or condemnation. That's not why I bring it up. I bring it up because there's only freedom when you trust Jesus for salvation. This is what we'll see throughout the book of Galatians. And this is what you can experience today if you've never done it. In fact, I wanna just close our time right now. And I wanna invite you, those of you who would say to this, I have fallen for a different gospel. Or maybe you would say, I've never really even heard this message before. This is all new to me. Maybe like when Paul first came to those churches in Galatia and they heard it for the very first time and they embraced it wholeheartedly. Maybe that's you today. Whatever it is, whether it's br you're brand new to this message or whether it's time for you to return to the real gospel of the Bible, I wanna invite you to pray a simple prayer like me. The Bible just says if you would recognize that you can't do it on your own, if you would recognize you're a sinner, if you would trust Jesus for salvation, then you'll be saved. That's what it says in Romans 3.22. It is by placing your faith in Jesus Christ. And, and one of the ways to do that is just to pray a prayer of faith. 
I'm going to pray some words right now and invite you, if, if this is you today, whether you're watching in, in one of our churches or whether you're watching at home, even by yourself or maybe with your family, if this is you, I invite you to pray this simple prayer of faith and trust Jesus for your salvation. Let's pray right now. If that's you today, I just invite you to pray a prayer like this after me. Jesus, I recognize that I'm a sinner and that I cannot save myself. I acknowledge that you went to the cross and you died there and you rose from the dead. And today I receive your work in my place and I trust fully in what you did on the cross for my salvation. Thank you, Jesus, for setting me free. Help me to live from this day forward in a new way. I pray it in Jesus' name, amen.